Hey guys, I hope you're having a great day. Today's video lecture topic is going to be the cycling of nutrients. Please make sure that you are filling in your notes organizer as we go along through this video. So we talked previously when we talked about food webs and how energy flows. Today we're going to be looking at how nutrients cycle. And the nutrients we're going to be looking at are water, nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus. So we're going to start off with something a little bit different. I want you to think about Albert Einstein. Now I want you to take a really deep breath and I want you to ask yourself, do you feel smarter? Do you? Because you should, because you're actually breathing in and taking in the exact same atoms and molecules and elements that Albert Einstein was when he was alive, which is really interesting. So let's talk about why that is. Why do nutrients have to be cycled? Simply speaking, there is a fixed amount of energy and matter that exists in the uni universe. So when this, mat this energy and matter is getting used up, you have to be able to recycle it back into the environment in order to allow it to take on different forms during different processes so that it can con continue to go around and around. Okay, so what's in it for me? Why in the world am I learning about the cycling of matter in a life science class like biology? Well, let's, let's start answering that question by reviewing. First of all, what are the building blocks of life? We know that those are cells. What are the building blocks of cells? We know that that's protein. What are the building blocks of proteins? Hmm, I remember learning about that, amino acids. And then finally, what are the building blocks of amino acids? Well, you've got various elements that are important to living things, but the ones we're going to focus today on are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So we're going to start with the easiest cycle. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you learned this a great deal when you were in um, earth science in the sixth grade, and that is the water cycle. So the water cycle, or also known as the hydrologic cycle, describes the continuous process by which water molecules move from bodies of water, land, and living things on Earth's surface up to the atmosphere and then back to Earth's surface. Now, we know that water is super important. In fact, it covers nearly 70% of the Earth's surface. Now, the problem is that only 1 to 2 percent is actually available as drinking water so thank goodness we have the water cycle that can help it continue going from one state and one form to another okay here's your definitions that you need to know for uh, number two evaporation is the process by which the surface of a liquid absorbs enough energy to change it into a gas so you're going from a liquid to a gas that is evaporation Transpiration is, the, is really the only one you might not have heard of, and that's just a special type of evaporation that happens through a plant's leaves. So we're still going from the liquid inside the leaf, and it's being released as a gas outside of the leaf through uh, what's called stomata. We'll learn about that later. And then you have condensation, which is the process by which the gas changes to a liquid. So we're going from the gas state to the liquid water state. Uh, this happens on the outside of your Coke can because the cold inside is meeting the warm outside. This happens in the clouds, right? And when that condensation gets heavy enough, then you have precipitation. And this is the different forms of water that fall back to the Earth's surface. And you remember, precipitation is not just rain. It can be rain, sleet, hail, or snow, depending on what temperature it is. Okay, what I want you to do now is I want you to pause the video on this picture or I want you to go back to one of the other pictures on the other slides if you preferred that. And I want you to use that space below number two to draw a very simple picture of the water cycle. Make sure you include those terms you just defined, evaporation, transpiration, condensation, and precipitation. So next up we have the nitrogen cycle. The Earth's atmosphere is actually made up of about 78% nitrogen. That's a very common misconception. Most people think that when you're breathing in air, you're breathing in oxygen. But very little of air is oxygen. Most of it is actually nitrogen. So nitrogen is super important. But the problem is that that nitrogen that exists in the atmosphere, N2, is not a usable form for plants and animals. We can't use it like it is in the atmosphere, so it has to be what's called fixed so that it can be used by living things. So the movement of nitrogen throughout the earth and the atmosphere is known as the nitrogen cycle. That is number 3C on your notes organizer. There are four main processes under the nitrogen cycle. There's nitrogen fixation, digestion, decomposition or denitrification, and then finally elimination or waste. And those are going to be the four vocab terms under number 3D. 
So let's start by talking about nitrogen fixation because this is super important. Nitrogen fixation is the process of capturing and converting nitrogen into a form that's usable by living animals. So it's taking the atmospheric nitrogen and fixing it into a form that can be used by plants and animals. There are three methods of nitrogen fixation. There are bacteria that are capable of fixing nitrogen so they can take it from that N2 form into something that's usable. A nitrogen fixation can happen through the energy of lightning. And then finally, we do have factories where we as humans are capable of fixing nitrogen by itself, even though that is a very expensive manner to do that. So let's talk about lightning. We, lightning is very high in energy. We know that. The high energy from lightning can actually break apart some of those nitrogen molecules that are existing in the atmosphere, allowing them to bond with the oxygen that's in the air, making them now a usable form. So the, the nitrogen molecules that were bonded together in two, there were two nitrogen atoms bonded together, they get split apart by the high energy lightning. And then they can bond with things like oxygen, and then those new compounds get carried down to the soil by the rain, where it can now be either absorbed by plants, or it can be used, or it can be consumed. Okay, so lightning is very important in the nitrogen cycle. And then, of course, we have our nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Now, some nitrogen-fixing bacteria are just sort of free-floating in the soil. Um, but there are some specific types of nitrogen-fixing bacteria that exist in close symbiotic relationships with plants. Remember, we talked about symbiosis, a long-term relationship between two different species. So some of these plants, like alfalfa, legumes, which would be like beans, peas, and corn, clover, and soy, they have these little nodules that are full of these nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And so what farmers will actually do is they'll put those crops like alfalfa or clover or soy or whatever into their rotation in order to return nitrogen to the soil so that the next year it's basically like ready-made fertilizer and they can plant something else and it's going to grow nice and big. Um, so what type of relationship is that between the nitrogen fixing bacteria and these different plants? Remember, your choices are parasitism, commensalism, or mutualism. So in the nitrogen-fixing plants that have the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, the bacteria are receiving nutrients from the plants because the plants are taking in you know, nutrients through their roots, um, and they're making glucose during photosynthesis. And then the plant itself is getting that nitrogen, that, that fixed nitrogen, basically for free. So they're helping each other out, which means what type of relationship is this? Mutualism, of course. Okay, here's the rest of your definitions up there under number 3D. So digestion is when the animals eat the plants that are full of that fixed nitrogen. And elimination is when the animals poop, ha ha ha. And the wastes are loaded with that nitrogen, returning it to the soil. That's why manure is such a fantastic fertilizer. And then finally, you have decomposition or denitrification, which is the, the basically unfixing of nitrogen, the process of breaking down elimination of nitrogen and returning the simple nitrogen to the soil and to the atmosphere. Okay, so again, pause on this picture or go back to one of the pictures of the nitrogen cycle from another slide and draw a very simple image in that space under number 3H. All of these pictures will help you greatly with something you will be doing in class over the next few days. Okay, moving on to the carbon cycle. Now, a lot of what I'm saying in the carbon cycle should be a review to you because it's all about the connection between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So let's review, big picture, what's the purpose of photosynthesis? The purpose of photosynthesis is to use energy from the sun in order to make glucose for the plant, right? Where does that take place? takes place in the chloroplast. The purpose of cellular respiration is to break down that glucose in order to produce energy. Where does that take place? The mitochondria. Okay, so we've got a, a quick review of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So the carbon cycle is this complex series of processes through which all carbon atoms rotate. Where can you find carbon? Carbon, we know, is very useful to living things. It uh, exists in many different forms. We have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which we are breathing out every single second. We have rocks that are full of carbon, like limestone. You have dead organic matter that's decaying that is full of carbon. And then finally, you have fossil fuels, which are deposits of coal, petroleum, and natural gas. 
So how does the carbon enter into the biotic environment? How does carbon get into living things? Well, carbon enters the biotic environment through the autotrophs, through the process of photosynthesis. Carbon is then returned to the atmosphere through the processes of respiration, decomposition, and the burning of those fossil fuels. Now, how are we as humans having an impact on this cycle? Well, we're constantly removing photosynthesizers when deforestation is going on, which means you're not allowing enough carbon, you're not allowing carbon to get into the environment in the way that it should. And then we're forcing the, the burning of fossil fuels through that combustion and all those, those different factories. Now, here's a very simple image. This is a quick summary of the carbon cycle. You can write this down under number 4H. Carbon is brought in through photosynthesis. Animals and plants return the carbon during respiration. The plants and animals are, die, are going to die and can eventually become fossil fuels like gasoline, oil, and coal. And those fossil fuels, when burned, return carbon to the atmosphere. So what's the big deal about burning those fossil fuels? You've probably heard a lot about this on the news in relation to you know, the global warming or climate change or whatever. And here's the thing. There has to be a very delicate balance of gases in in our atmosphere and on our earth uh, between the you know oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitrogen or whatever there's a very delicate balance that must exist the problem is that humans are putting too much carbon back into the atmosphere causing an increase in trapped heat bottom line is that carbon would go back into the atmosphere anyways because even the fossil fuels are going to break down eventually due to weathering and erosion and all that stuff we're just forcing it to happen at a much faster rate and so the idea is that because we're putting all this carbon back into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels by removing photosynthesizers is that we're creating what's called the greenhouse effect which can, which can potentially lead to this idea of global warming where the overall temperature of the earth increased to, to a very dangerous level. Okay, so once again, pause on this picture or, you know, go back to one of those simple pictures on the other slide and uh, draw the carbon cycle, making sure you include things like photosynthesis, cell respiration, burning, uh, the different plants and animals, that sort of thing. And then last up we have the phosphorus cycle. The phosphorus cycle really is most similar to the nitrogen cycle. It's a sedimentary cycle where you have phosphates that go from organic, meaning living, to inorganic, meaning non-living. And phosphorus is an essential nutrient for, for plants and animals and really all living things because it's a key, a key component in ATP, adenosine triphosphate, um, which we know we need for energy. It's a key component in DNA. Remember, sugars and phosphates make up the backbone. It's a key component and lipids so it's important for it to be able to cycle through so that we as living things can get it in the different forms that we need it so over time rain and weathering are going to cause rocks to release the inorganic phosphate meaning it's coming from a non-living thing the inorganic phosphate is going to be distributed through the soil and the water Plants are going to be responsible for taking up that inorganic phosphate, absorbing it in through their roots, and then those plants that are full of those phosphates are going to be consumed by animals giving them the phosphate. So very, again, very similar to what happens in the nitrogen cycle. Now, when a plant or animal dies that has that, you know, phosphate in it, they decay and now organic phosphate is returned to the soil. Bacteria are going to decompose just like they're, they do. They're good at that. They break down the organic phosphate into inorganic phosphate in the soil. And then the phosphorus in the soil can end up back in the water. Okay, so here's your picture of the phosphorus cycle. Make sure you filled in all your notes there, and then you can pause on that picture and draw a very simple image. It doesn't have to be anything too complex, but again, it will help you with an activity that we're going to do over the next couple of days. Okay, and that ends our video lecture on the cycling of matter. Hopefully that was pretty clear to you, but if you feel like you need some extra review or some extra help on any of these cycles, I've put some tutorials and links on the blog. Really, honestly, click on those. I think walking through it will really help you understand these different processes and why they're so important to living things. Hope you're having a good day. Bye.